Our Father, we thank you, Lord, that you've given us another opportunity to come to your house and before thy people. Bless this brother now, Lord. Give him the gift of teaching. Father, I pray for the anointing. I pray that you bless him. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, is this on? Can you hear me? Okay. Good morning. Well, we've got a, got a lot of ground to cover here, so we'll get right into it. Um, we use this board a lot this morning because there's going to be a lot of scriptural references, and I know that you're not going to be able to remember all of them. Um, and if you watch this later, I'll be able to, you'll be able to look at these on the, uh, on the board there, and we'll draw some pretty pictures for you so it's easier to understand some things. I know it is for me. Um, I'm going to go ahead, and let's go ahead and get right into it here. Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 8. Ezekiel chapter 8. We start in verse 14. Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 14. I'm going to go ahead and pray. I know pastor just prayed, but I'm going to go ahead and pray. Father, Lord God, I thank you for this opportunity to teach your word. Lord God, it's not an easy thing, especially if you don't show up, Lord. So I pray that you... That you show up this morning, anoint this teacher, may it go out to the people that are listening on the internet and in the congregation today, Lord, I pray that it's a blessing to them, and I know it was for me. In Lord Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay, let's go to Ezekiel 8, verse 14, we're going to read down through 16. Ezekiel 8, 14, it says, Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north. And behold, there sat, a woman, sat women weeping for Tammuz. Then said he unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations than these. And he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house. And behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about five and twenty men, with their backs toward the temple of the Lord, and their faces toward the east. And they worshipped the sun toward the east. Okay, there's three points I want you all to pay attention to. Can you still hear me? Is it still still on? Okay. Technology. Okay, so there's three points I want you to pay attention to. First one is the north gate. Let me know if I have to turn this up. Tamuz. And the east. These are all three significant points that you'll see over and over in in the book of uh, Ezekiel. First one we're talking about is the north gate. What's the significance of that north gate? Well, it's often referred to as the Damascus gate. You'll hear it referred to that as the Damascus gate. Now, some expositors say that that's the the gate that the Lord went out when he was crucified. Uh, Some others say the sheep gate. Uh, It doesn't really matter for for this period of instruction. It doesn't really matter. Uh, But I want you to pay attention to it because the north, the north is important. Um, You'll notice over here, go back to Ezekiel 8, verse 3 and 4. And you're going to notice something in Ezekiel 8, verses 3 and 4. It says, And he put forth the form of of an hand, and took me by a lock of mine head, and the Spirit lifted me up between the earth and the heaven, and brought me in the visions of God, to Jerusalem, to the door of the inner gate that looketh toward the north, where was the seat of the image of jealousy, which provoketh the jealousy. And behold, the glory of God of Israel was there, according to the vision that I saw in the plant. Now, obviously, Ezekiel 8, if you've, read your, if you've read your Bible, and I hope you have, Ezekiel 8, he's taken them into the temple, and he's shown the apostasy that Israel is in. And he has them dig through the wall, and he goes into, this, he goes into the inner court there, and he starts, and he sees a... Uh, these men, and all these abominations are around them. And he's shown Ezekiel what is going on in that time in Israel, the great apostasy that's taking place. So he takes him here, and he sees this seat of jealousy. It's in the north gate. Okay, So pay attention to that, the north gate. Now, if you go over to uh, Isaiah, where's my eraser? I don't have an eraser. If you go to Isaiah 14, 13, somebody give me a tissue, please. I Messed up, didn't bring one. So let's go to Isaiah 14. My wife will get one, thank you. 
Isaiah 14, and verse 13 and 14. Thank you. I'm going to erase this. It's okay. Got this. You'll notice there, it's talking about Lucifer. Now, you've heard Pastor talk about it uh, a lot. Isaiah 14, 13. And you've heard him mention this. Now, it says this, For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the, above the stars of God. Notice the throne. Notice the seat of jealousy. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. So this is Lucifer saying he's going to put his throne above God. And where's it at? Well, Psalm 75, 6 says... For promotion cometh neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south. So God resides in the north. If you take your compass and you were to lay it on the table, it would tell you exactly where heaven is. God uses that to you know, get all the uh, so-called smart people and they try to figure out where heaven's at. Well, it's in the north. That's where promotion comes out of. That's where Lucifer wanted to ascend above. So the seat that's in the north gate is the image of jealousy. It provoketh God to jealousy. Now, why is that? Well... If you go over here to uh, Revelation 2, and all this stuff is connected. Revelation 2, verse 13, and we'll go from there to 13, too. All these things are connected. They're pointing towards something. Okay? Revelation chapter 2, verse 13. Pay special attention to this. It says... I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. See that seat? That provoketh the jealousy. And thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in the days where an Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. So this seat that provoketh God the jealousy is connected with Satan. It's in the north. That's where Satan wanted to ascend above, okay? Now go over to 13.2, Revelation 13.2. Some people think that Revelation, you can't understand it, or it's a, it's a closed book, or a lot of these Old Testament prof, prophetical books are, are closed. That's just because, number one, they're probably not born again. This, is, this book is spiritually discerned, and they don't know how to understand Scripture, comparing Scripture with Scripture, okay? Revelation 13, 2. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat. And great authority. So there's the Antichrist rising up out of the sea, and there's that seat. Now, you'll notice when the Pope speaks, he speaks ex cathedra, which means what? From the chair. Now, any Pope down through history is well qualified to be the Antichrist at any time. They wear their little silly robes or vestments, and their, their silly hat, and they dig on the fish god, and they got the star of rim fan, and all these things that are on that. If you study that, you'll understand those things. Now, if you want to find out the where their priesthood comes, comes from, you just go to Judges 17, and you'll see Micah's priest, and, he's called, and he calls him father. And he has vestments and all these things. That's a different study in and of itself. But understand, these scriptures are pointing towards something. Now, obviously in Revelation, we're talking about the tribulation period. Okay? So you've got idol worship that's taking place. You've got this image set up in the north, and it provokes God of jealousy. Well, <clears throat> first commandment, in the Pentateuch is thou shalt have no other gods before me. That's God's first commandment to Israel, right? So here it says this in Exodus 32, and we're going to see this. Exodus 32 and 32. We're going to go through some of this stuff rather fast because we've got a lot of ground to cover. I hope you're familiar with most of the subject matter here. Exodus 32, verse 32. We're going to read 33 and then 35. This is Moses talking to the Lord. He says, Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of the book which thou hast written. And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. That's the book of life. Verse 35, And the Lord plagued the people because they made the calf which Aaron made. Okay, so they're worshiping an idol. There's that golden calf, Apis the bull. Now, you'll notice something. You don't have to turn there. 
because I know I've got a lot of turn in here. You'll notice something. Where did the Israelites learn to worship that golden calf? Well, they learned it in Egypt, right? But when did they learn it? This is one of those things where the Scripture doesn't speak about it in um, Exodus. I'll put the reference up here. Ezekiel 20, verse 8. If you want to turn there, you can. You'll see something interesting here the Scripture pulls out. Ezekiel 20, verse 8. This is Israel's apostasy. 20, verse 8 says, But they rebelled against me, and would not hearken unto me. And they, they did not, every man, cast away the abominations of their eyes. Neither did they forsake the idols of Egypt. Then I said, I will pour out my fury upon them to accomplish my anger against them in the midst of the land of Egypt. What does that mean? That means that Israel was worshiping idols in the midst of Egypt before the, evening, before the Passover, before any of those things. So God was going to, he was going to wipe them out. But look at verse 9, it says, But I wrought for my name's sake that it should not be polluted before the heathen, among whom they were, in whose sight I made myself known unto them, and bringing them forth out of the land of Egypt. So the only reason he didn't destroy them is because of his sake, his name's sake. Why? He, he, he saved those people because of his name, because of the covenant he made with Abraham. Not them. And you'll read in Deuteronomy, I'll paraphrase, but uh, Moses is rebuking Israel saying, don't think because of your righteousness you're going into this land. It's because this heathen I want you to destroy. Okay, so remember that. It doesn't talk about that in Exodus, but it talks about it here in Ezekiel. Okay, so back to this. So idol worship will get you taken out of the book of life. Okay? You understand that. Now, if you go to Daniel 3, we're going to read this. Daniel 3, 1. We'll start there. 1 through 6. I like making you turn a lot of pages. Okay. Daniel 3. I'm, I'm connecting all these dots here, and we're going to, we're going to make a, uh, some sense out of it here in a minute. And I hope you see the way it's it's turning. Daniel 3, verses 1 through 6. It says, Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold. There's the image. Whose height was three score cubits and the breadth thereof six cubits. What's three score? Sixty. And six. There's those sixes. He set it up in the plain of Dur in the province of Babylon. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather together the princes, the governors, and the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and the rulers and all the, and all, of all the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Then the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces were gathered together unto the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a herald cried out, To you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye ye fall down and worship the, the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king hath set up. And whoso faileth not, falleth not down, and worship shall the same hour be cast, cast into the midst of the fiery furnace. Okay. So you've got this image set up in Daniel chapter 3. Nebuchadnezzar being a type of who? The Antichrist. He's one of the greatest types of the Antichrist in all the Bible. So you've got this image. It's three score, three score uh, cubits high, 60, and, and six wide. Okay, there's your six and your six. You're just missing one more six. Okay, and he says uh, he's going to set up this image. And then he says when the music starts, you're going to fall down and worship. So music is connected with the devil. Why? Because... He's the anointed cherub that covereth. He originally was the band leader. Okay, you have God's music, which lifts up the Lord, and then you have Satan's music. Okay, go over here to Ezekiel 28. Ezekiel 28. Should be verse 13. Yes. Towards the bottom... Towards the bottom of the uh, scripture there. So Ezekiel 28. Can you all see this okay? Okay. 28. 13. 
Look towards the bottom of the scripture. He says, The work, workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. See that? So that music, those tabrets and those pipes are part. They're somehow an inorganic matter is included within his creation. So music is connected with Satan. And so therefore when this music starts and they fall down and worship at that music. And they worship the image of the beast. Now what does this have to do with? Well, folks you see all around you, you see churches all the time, so-called churches. You'll notice in the book of Acts, just because it's called a church doesn't make it a church. A pagan temple is called a church in the book of Acts. Just because it's called one doesn't make it a church. The church is the, is the bride of Christ, the body of Christ. And so these churches out here, you have there's, they're, they're not separating the holy and the profane. And notice all their, their so-called worship service is connected with music. Why? Because it gets the flesh moving. You see, and they're, they're being conditioned to what? Go into the tribulation and take the mark. They're, they're already set up right now for it. Okay? So the Lord puts these little nuggets throughout the scripture, just here and there. This kind of little odd statements, just kind of looks out of place. You've got to connect it. You've got to compare scripture to scripture, and the Lord will fill in the blanks here. But it's spiritually discerned. Okay? The world is blind. They can't see these things. Okay? So watch this. Go to Revelation 13. 13, 14. I have one more reference here. And then 14, 9 through 11, next. <clears throat> okay. Revelation 13, 14. Scripture says, And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword, and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast. There's an image, folks. That the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Just like Nebuchadnezzar said, if you don't worship this image, you're going to be cast into the fiery furnace. Same thing going on here in the tribulation. If you don't take the mark, which we'll read that over here, if you don't take the mark, guess what? You're cast into the fiery furnace, you get your head chopped off, you must endure unto the end to be saved. You can't take the mark. You can't buy or sell or get food or anything without that mark. You see that? Because when the Antichrist comes, he's going to be all, he's going to be in charge, just like Nebuchadnezzar was in charge. He's not going to ask people's opinions in Parliament or Congress or any of these other things that we have now. No, he's going to be the man in charge. He's the man of sin. Okay, so you see over here, this what will get you taken out of the book of life, just like it did in Exodus, is if you worship that image. That's God's first commandment. And if you worship that image in the tribulation, they'll be taken out of the book of life. Over here in Revelation 14, verse 9 through 11. 14, verses 9 through 11. It says, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. Just real quick, that's the cup that Christ took on Calvary. That, that cup was poured out upon him every last drop. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So he took that cup. But these people are going to take that cup for eternity. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascended up, ascendeth up forever and ever. And they have no rest day or night who worship the, the beast and his image and whosoever received the mark in his, in his name. So there's idol worship taking place in the tribulation. Okay, that's what gets you taken out of the book of life. And that's what's going on here. That's why it provokes God to jealousy. Because they're worshiping in an image. And it's set up in the north just to, just to get on God's nerves. Because Lucifer knows exactly where promotion comes from. So that's the significance there that you just read about in uh, Ezekiel chapter 8 in that north gate. Now, let's move on to the next point, which is Tammuz. You'll notice Tammuz. Who is this 
Tamu's character. Um, let's go ahead and erase these. Now, Tamu's is known by a bunch of different names and other um, mythologies, pagan religions, but it's the same character. We're going to go through just a couple of them um, because we don't have time to go through all of them. If you, if you want, you can read uh, Hislop's book, the two, the two Babylons, which I'll put up here, which you need to read. And you can get the complete history of all these things. It's Alexander Hislop. Okay. By the way, that book is outlawed by the Catholic Church. Okay, so is Fox's Book of Martyrs and King James Bible. But, okay. So Tammuz here, you have in verse, let's go back to Ezekiel. Let's go back to Ezekiel where we started. Chapter 8. And we'll go to verse 14 again. It says, Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which is the temple, which was toward the north, and behold, there sat we- women weeping for Tammuz. Okay? Now you'll notice that today in the Jewish calendar, their fourth month is called Tammuz. They got that from their captivity when they got mixed up with the Babylonians, and they came out. Okay? So they have that stuff in there now. All right, so this Tammuz character, he's, uh, he's the sun god, or he's Nimrod incarnate, reincarnate. Or Baal. Now, you remember that um, the golden calf that they set up, right? Here's my best attempt at a drawing. Here's a little cow. It's pretty good, isn't it? He's got horns. Okay. Ape is the bull. And he goes down like something like this. All right. And he has right here, over his head... He's your little eyes here. He's got a sun disc. Okay? That represents the sun god. Now, Tammuz is the god who goes down into earth and comes up back every spring, and the flowers appear, and they worship that god. Now, they worship the sun because for every truth, Satan has a counterfeit. So, to a pagan, that sun is the most powerful thing, it's the life giver. Right? So that's why they worship the sun. Now, Tammuz, he's known by different names. And I'll, I'll uh, put a few of them down here. In Greek, he's known as Adonis. You've heard that, uh, maybe that term. People say, oh, he's an Adonis, somebody who has great physical stature, because that's who it's referred to. Okay, The Romans, he's Bacchus. My bowl is going to get in the way here. Okay. In Egypt, he's known as Horus. Okay. So all these things here, and the rites of Bacchus, every Roman emperor took these rites, and it was a drunken orgy, like Caligula is one of the worst ones demons possess. The rites of Bacchus, because why it has to do with fertility. Every pagan worship service has, has to do some form or fashion with sex. That's the way they are. Okay, you see it today. You notice when uh, when uh, uh, Josiah, I think it was Josiah, I have to look again, when he destroyed all the houses of the Sodomites, where were they next to? The temple of God. So those worship services are always connected with sex. That's the, that's the way the pagan religions work. And now you'll see all over the country, I was up in uh, Charleston, West Virginia not too long ago, and there was uh, rainbow flags in a, an Episcopal church. So that's where you're, you're headed to. There's nothing new under the sun. Okay? So this Tammuz character is all these guys here, and there's more than that. That's just a few of them. Okay? But this Tammuz, this is Apis the Bull. Now, if you've ever seen, uh, let's see what time it is, CCB DeMille's Ten Commandments. Most of you probably have, right? Well, you'll notice that their priests wore leopard, leopard skins. Okay? And the reason that is is because... Nimrod, the first type of Antichrist, 
His name means Nimr Odd, subduer of the leopard, or subduer of the spotted one. Okay, so that's this guy here. And they learned this in the midst of Egypt. And they learned to worship the sun and all these different abominations to God. Remember, they were given the commandments because of transgressions. Right? Well, this is one of their great transgressions. That's why Aaron so quickly knew how to make that thing. Okay? So when you see these people over here and these women weeping for Tammuz, that's who they're weeping for. And every, every spring we call it Easter. Okay? For, that's for Astarte, Ishtar, the Queen of Heaven. Okay, you'll find that in your King James Bible, Acts 12, verse 4. He was to be let out after Easter. It's not Passover. That's a different study in and of itself. But there's a reason the Holy Spirit wanted that in there, so that you would know that what Easter truly is, is a, it, it is pagan. Now, we, we call it that because of tradition. If you call it Resurrection Sunday, nobody would know what you're talking about. Because of tradition, making the Word of God of none effect, we have to do those things so people understand what we're talking about. Okay? Because everybody out there, they, they, they think Easter has to do with bunnies and Cadbury eggs and everything else. Okay? Now, where do they get that? They get it from Babylon, and, and it's a whole different study. But that's where they get it. Okay? So we got Tammuz there. Here's an interesting thing. You've heard of Zoroastrianism. All right, Zoroaster. Okay, it's a Chaldean. It goes back to the Chaldeans, the Babylonian priests. What that word means is this. Seed of the woman. These are sun worshippers, fire worshippers. That's what that means. The Chaldeans, that's page 61, by the way, in Hislop's book, if you want to reference that. Okay? That means seed of the woman. Now, where did they get that? Genesis 3.15. This brings up another interesting point. If you go to Daniel 3.25, this is changed in all the new Bibles. Daniel 3.25, you'll see something there. Daniel 3.25. Scripture says, He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Now, who has something else other than capitalized S there? If you do, you have a different Bible. Now, the expositors will say, well, there's no way Nebuchadnezzar could have known that that would have been the Son of God and so on and so forth. Oh, contraire. That, that right there, that prophecy goes all the way back to the garden and it was passed down orally. And everybody knew that a God-man was going to come and be the deliverer of the world. Now, you'll have Cupid Boy, you'll have all these different perversions of who he is, <clears throat> but the pagans all knew and he's called the, uh, the kneeler. He was the crush, the, the, the head of the serpent. All these things. Before the scripture was ever even written, they understood these things. Okay? So when people try to say that, they're wrong. The further you get away from creation, the more ignorant you are. Okay? Just God always had his witness. Now, sometimes God winked at these things, as it says in Acts 17. But now he causes everybody to repent. Why? Because the truth is revealed from faith to faith. Okay? Now you have you definitely have no excuse. You had no excuse before, but now you definitely have no excuse. Okay? Because you have the Word of God written. So that seed of the woman, that is Tammuz, Zoroaster, okay, Horus, Bacchus, Adonis, all these things. <clears throat> if, you, if you just want to Google Queen of Heaven in your phone later when you're looking these things up, you'll see all kind of things show up. Here, let me give you another one. This is the Egyptian Trinity. Osiris, Isis, it's kind of a coincidence, and Horus. Okay, this is him reincarnate. Okay, this is him come back up. Horus's, Tammuz. All right, so there's the Egyptian trinity. All right, and you'll see that black Madonna. She's like an onyx stone or something like that, and she's holding the baby. Well, if you look right there in the Catholic Church, what do you see? You see the exact same thing. You saw the same thing in Rome, you saw the same thing in Greece. Once again, greatest goddess Diana, that's who that is. That's Semiramis, that's Nimrod's wife. Okay? So all these things are connected. They're all connected. Okay? <clears throat> always remember that. Satan always has a counterfeit. 
Okay, let's go to Romans one twenty. Romans one twenty. We're going to look at the Lord has to say here. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that there are without excuse. The power of the Godhead, okay? Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Right? Now, people look at that and say, what does that mean? Well, this is interesting because the Son, which is a type of Christ, right? Malachi 4.2, he's called the Son of Righteousness, spelled S-U-N with a capital S. Wish I had a better eraser. Mm. Bear with me. This is a horrible eraser. Okay, so we got the sun, and it has three types of rays. Okay, you've got the heat ray, you've got the light ray, and you have the actinic ray or the ultraviolet ray. Uh, ray. Okay, now the heat ray you can feel, but you can't see. That's God, the Holy Ghost. Okay, the light ray you can see, but you can't feel. That's God the Son. And this third one down here, the actinic ray, you can't see or feel. But if it was to touch you, you would die immediately. That's God the Father. Okay. Now, we're going to get on to the... uh, Talk about the sun here for a minute. But every time it rises in the east comes up blood red, and it sets its blood red. Okay? He came as the Lamb of God. When He comes back, He comes to judge and make war. So you have the first and second advent every morning as you see. So you see these people who are worshiping these things. Let me just go through a few. uh, Malachi 4, 1 through 2. He's called the bright morning star, Revelation 22, 16. Let me uh, erase this again. So we've got the heat ray, the light ray, and the actinic ray. I'm going to write in blue now. All right, so we have Revelation. Twenty two sixteen. He's that bright morning star. We have uh, Second Peter one nineteen. He's called the day star. Okay, this is bright morning star. Uh, what is Lucifer called? Son of the morning. He's a counterfeit. And then you have, turn to Psalm uh, 19. Psalm 19. Verses 1 through 4. You'll see something interesting here tucked in the scripture. Now what you just read in Romans 1.20, they'll be without excuse. The Godhead is shown. Psalm 19, verses 1 through 4. To get through this quickly. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. The beginning of knowledge is the belief in God. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun. There's the tabernacle, and that caveat's right into the next part of the east. Okay? The east. There we go, that raised. So the Holy Spirit 
moves from east to west. The world moves west to east. If you're going with the world, you're going against Christ. If you're going against the world, you're going with Christ. If you're standing still, you're going with the world. So if you're stagnant, you're backsliding. If you're not constantly pressing toward the mark, then you're backsliding. You're moving back. When Cain left the garden, he went west to east. When Jacob escaped from Esau, he went west to east. Okay? So we have this tabernacle for the sun that God tells Moses to set up in the wilderness. And you have this little gray looking tent nothing really to look at got little horns okay these are my best cherubs I can do okay so we have north east south, and west. Now the children of Israel were encamped around that tabernacle. So you have the brazen altar, the brazen labor, table of showbread, six loaves on this side, six on that side, 66 books on the table. He said, I am the bread of life, seven golden candlesticks, seven spirits of God, and also a type of Christ. And then the altar of incense and prayer, taking the coals off of this altar, and put them on there, and that's a type of prayer going up before God, right? If you take fire from anywhere else, God will consume you. Nadab and Abihu, they took strange fire and offered to the Lord. Why? Because it didn't come from here. That's a type of Calvary. Okay? And then you have the Holy of Holies, and you have cherubs sitting upon that mercy seat, and God would come in there and commune with the high priest every, every year, the Day of Atonement. And how you entered this thing is you went around here, and you came from east to west. East to west, right? This opening here, Straight as a gate, narrow is the way. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If, you, if any man try to climb up, climb up any other way, he's a thief and a robber. You see that? So the Holy Spirit moves east to west. There's a lot of lessons right here in just this little boring tent that the Lord spends so much time on. I think eight, nine chapters. And he spends two chapters on creation. Why? Because this is connected to His Son. This is how you approach God. And this is how the Holy Spirit moves. East to west. Now, we don't have enough time to get into all that. <coughs> okay? But, I just want to mention real quick, Ezekiel, in the book of Ezekiel, 58 times, that's mentioned, east. 148 total in the Bible. So when the Lord repeats something, there's something to that. You need to pay attention to that. Okay? So 58 times in the book of Ezekiel. Okay? Here's a few other just uh, nuggets for you. Uh, when God forced Israel to go around Kadesh Barnea, they went down, wandered in the desert for 40 years, number of tribulation, and they came up and they had to come east to west. He wouldn't let them go west to east. Right? They, they got afraid. They saw the giants. They wouldn't go in. He made them go east to west. Protestant Reformation, 1517, it began October 31st. You had a Protestant. We're not Protestants, but I'm just giving you the history of it. Okay, we're Baptists. We never were a part of the Catholic Church. <clears throat> okay? So therefore, but that the significance of that is this. When Martin Luther in 1517 put that, that 95 Theses on the Castle Rock Church in Wittenberg, 1521, he translates the uh, New Testament from Erasmus Greek text, which is one of the Greek texts that makes up this King James Bible. He translated it into German in the New Testament, 1521. That was the first time that those people had the New Testament or any part of the Bible in their own language. Okay, 1534, he translates the entire Bible, Hebrew and Greek, into German. And it's also 1534 is when Henry VIII broke away from the Catholic Church. Now, he was a monster. We won't give him any credit, but he did these things. 1611, you have the King James Bible. Now, fast forward a little bit. You have November 11th, 1620, the Mayflower Compact. The Mayflower lands in America, in the New World. And their purpose was to evangelize the New World. 
Actually, one of my ancestors, great ancestors, was born on that Mayflower. It's the only, she's, he was the only one born. Uh, Oceanus Hopkins is his name, but enough about Hopkins family history. But you can see how it goes east to west. When Paul wanted to go into Asia, the Lord stopped him. He said, no, you're going to go to Macedonia, east to west. You see that? And those are just a few examples of how the Lord moves. Okay? But when Christ t- returns, go to Matthew 24. should be familiar with this. Matthew 24. We only have a couple minutes. Verse 27. Matthew 24, verse 27. For as the lightning cometh out of the east, and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So Matthew 24. This thing is just murdered. It's just horrible. Okay, Matthew 24. Twenty-seven. Now go to Zechariah. Fourteen, verse three. And Ezekiel. We'll get through all these. Forty-four. One and two. All right. Ezekiel, Zechariah. Second to the last book in the Old Testament. Zechariah 14.3. I'm sorry, 14.4. I'll start reading at verse 3. Well, I'll I'll start at verse 2. It says, For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women, women ravished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations, even as when he fought in the day of battle, and his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be, notice the east first and then west, and there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north, and half of it toward the south. So that's when the Lord returns, the day of battle, when did, when did the Lord fight for Israel in the day of battle? Go back to Joshua. Joshua chapter 10. He's one of the greatest types of Christ. That's what his name means, Jehovah saves. The entire book of Joshua is a type of the second advent. Okay? Now watch this here. Joshua 10, 13 and 14. We've got to get through these. And then uh, have, we'll go to Habakkuk after this. And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is, this, is not this written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood, stood still in the midst of heaven, and hasted not to go down about a whole day. And there was no day like that before it or after it, that the Lord hearkened unto the voice of a man, for the Lord fought for Israel. That's a tech, type of the second advent. When he fights for Israel, when he comes back, behold, I saw heaven open, and behold, a, a white horse, and he that sat upon him is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he hath judge and make war. Okay? So that's a second advent reference. It historically happened, but it's pointing to something greater. Go to Habakkuk real fast. Habakkuk chapter 3. Where I'm turning to, he's hidden in there. There he is. Three verse eleven. So we'll go through uh, Habakkuk three. Let's put it up here. Eleven. I think it's through thirteen. 
3.11 through 13, it says, The sun and the moon stood still in their habitation. At the light of thine arrows they went, and at the shining of thy glittering spear. Thou didst march through the land of indignation. Thou didst thresh, thresh the heathen in anger. This is the second advent. Thou, thou wentest forth for the salvation of thy people. Even, that's the Jew, that's Israel. Even for salvation with thine own anointed. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. Thou woundest the head of the house of the wicked. There's Genesis 3.15. Wounded the head, bruised the head of the serpent. Okay? Uh, by discovering the foundation under the neck. Selah. So what you have there, another reference to the second advent. East to west. East to west. Now, uh, we don't have any time left, so we'll have to leave it there. Um, so the Lord goes down to King's Highway, crosses the River Jordan, steps on the Mount of Olives, goes through the, goes over the Muslim graveyard that's there, and he goes through the east gate, goes up to the temple and sits down, and starts to judge the nations. Sheep nations on the left or on the right, goat nations on the left. Second advent. All right, let's pray. Father, Lord God, I thank you for this message. Pray that it bless the uh, hearers out there today. Pray that it goes forth and accomplishes that which you please. I pray for the service this afternoon, Lord, or this morning. I pray for our pastor. Pray that you give him the anointing, the ability to preach. Give him the liberty he needs to be able to preach. In Lord Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right.